Okay, I will have a brief introduction. So today we have a great pleasure to invite uh, speaker, Dr. Sarah McAllister from the US Forest Service, the Missouri Fire Lab. I think it's the best fire research lab, uh, wildland fire research lab in the world. And um, Sarah did a, a, his PhD, her PhD from UC Berkeley. Um, well, I'm familiar with, I did my postdoc there. And um, I remember Sarah did a, her PhD project in some NASA project about the PMMA ignition and the fire spread. And uh, later on, uh, she moved to the wildland fire research about uh, the, the flame spread in the wildland and uh, also related to fire ecology problems. So I think that's um, maybe you will share some interesting parts about how you change the research topic in today's talk. And she ha has also co-authored a textbook for the combustion and um, like write a lot of papers, more than 80 peer reviewed publications. And, uh, and I also uh, mentioned a lot about uh, Sarah's uh, work about ignition in my own fire dynamics class. So I think it's uh, really good to hear um, some deep insights from Sarah today. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, but yeah, I mean, the switch between burning PMMA and wildland fuels was was a fairly natural one. Um, living in the, the western part of the United States, wildland fire is uh, very much a, a almost everyday thing now, unfortunately. <laughs> so it very much impacts us. And it was a it was an obvious switch, really. Um, so I think, um, should I go ahead and start sharing my screen? Yes, please. Okay. Um, let's see here, let's get my presentation going. Well, let's go back to the first slide. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk about wildland fire today, which is gonna be probably something very different from the usual topic, I guess, that you guys hear in these uh, webinars. Um, like I said, it's a very, a pronounced problem in the western part of the U.S., but you know we saw, especially this last summer, that it—I mean—it happens all over the world. It impacts people all over the world, um, and it's something that uh, you know is definitely worth the uh, SFPE's attention. I think, um, and I will apologize at the outset that a lot of my specific examples are uh, in the U.S. because you know I work for the Forest Service and I live here, um, and, but you know the problems are. Yeah, acutely <laughs> a thing here, but you know, they are a lot of the, the, the things that I'm talking about in the examples are applicable around the world as well. Um, so they might be said, very US based, but um, true, true in many other places as well. So when I talk about a wildland fire and there being a problem, this is really what I mean. It's not the fact that there are wildland fires themselves, right? The forest can burn and really, as I'll, I'll kind of get into a little bit, they need to and so it's not necessarily a bad thing when wildfires happen it's the fact that they then burn through communities burn down houses injure and kill people and they're you know we could be choked by smoke for months you know and the other health impacts from that right so this is really the problem right is the fact that these wildland fires impact people not that they that they are there so what I want to talk about uh, is why we actually have this problem, which involves giving some historical perspective, which again is going to be pretty specific to the US, but is actually applicable in many other places around the world. Um, understanding the problem also involves diving a little bit into some fire ecology and understanding what a fire adapted, adapted ecosystem is. Um, and that will bring us to the idea of that we need to figure out how to live with fire and there's some research that we need to do in order to get there. And so the last part, part of my talk, I'm gonna be talking about the work that our group has done. Um, we've got a great team of people um, with a whole variety of skills from building experimental, experimental apparatuses to foresters and other mechanical engineers um, that are you know, dreaming up the experiments and trying to understand how everything works. So why is there a fire problem? Well, really there's three reasons why. Um, and these, I guess, are, are true in a lot of other places as well. So one of the reasons is that there is a growth of the wildland urban interface, the WUI, right? So particularly in the US, there's a lot of people moving from cities into more rural areas. So they're moving into where the wildland fuels are. 
in other places, particularly say in like Europe, there's actually a reverse uh, trend happening. People are moving from rural communities back into urban areas and they're leaving behind their agriculture land, their farms, places that used to be, you know, the, 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 where the land was managed and it was, um, it was irrigated, it was, you know, crops, um, which aren't necessarily what you would consider something, you know, of a wildland, but once they are left, when these people um, go into the cities, they revert back to wildland fuels. So the people that are remaining into the, in the rural areas are actually finding themselves in a wildland urban interface suddenly. So th this is a problem because that means people are closer to the wildlands. That means the ignition sources and the communities are closer to the fuels. You're kind of mixing everything all together. And that really changes what we can and can't do with how we manage the land and the fires. And it ultimately means that when there's people and fuels and fire, it means there's a greater impact on society. Uh, another reason that we have a fire problem that's been talked a lot is climate change, right? Uh, in places where there's historically been fire, there's longer, hotter, and drier fire seasons. And that's, you know, no question. But we're also seeing that there are areas that didn't used to have uh, fires that are suddenly having fires. You know, you're thinking, you know, like Northern European, you Northern Europe, you know, like in Sweden, like there used to be not... The fire used, didn't used to be a necessarily a problem there, but they're um, becoming much more frequent there. And the other thing about climate change that doesn't necessarily get acknowledged is that it is making things like uh, drought and insects and disease outbreaks much worse, right? So um, it's prolonging the droughts, it's making these insects and disease um, spread further into different ranges that they wouldn't have before. Uh, and that's, you know, you could see the impact of that in this um, picture of this report here that's on the, the slide is, you know, there's a lot of dead trees out there in some areas, you know, and that, you know, obviously will change the dynamics of the fire. Um, and finally, the third reason is something that um, is very important in the U.S., but is also present in other, in other areas like Australia and Canada is the fact that we've been putting fires out very aggressively for over 100 years. You know, and we're really good at putting out all the fires when they're very small in mild and moderate conditions because we can. So the Forest Service um, has a their statistic that they put out all of their fires or 97 percent of their fires when they're very small, you know, less than, you know, maybe 100 hectares. Um, you know, so the only fires that burn really are those three percent that are on in the worst possible conditions. Right. And so historically, they used to burn under a much wider range of conditions and sometimes quite frequently. We'll, we'll get into this a little bit. And that's had a dramatic change in the fuel loads, the distribution of the, the fuel itself, and the composition of our forests. Um, and much like climate change, it's had an impact on drought, insects, and disease because those disturbances are having a much bigger impact on um, these overloaded forests, you know, the, if you've got, you know, 100 trees per hectare versus 1000 trees per hectare and you have a drought, obviously, it, you know, it makes sense that if you have fewer trees, they're going to be less water stressed. So really, it's all these three things that combine to, to form the current problem um, in the US, but really around the world as well. Um, and because of its importance, I want to talk a little bit more about what this um, fire exclusion has, what effect this fire exclusion has had and what this means. Because normally when you hear talk about wildland fire, right, um, inevitably some kind of statistics come up, right, in, you know, indicating just how it's gotten worse over the last several you know, years. And so often, you know, this is, these are U.S. statistics, but you'll see a graph that looks something like this, where you've got the area burned, it's a, the blue line over time, and then the number of fires in orange, right? So despite the fact that the number of fires has, restained, has remained relatively constant since the late 70s, uh, the, the area that has burned has seemingly seemed to grow, right? And this is a cause for concern for a lot of people, so it's rightfully so. Um, you know, so like bad fire years now burn about 4 million hectares a year in the United States with this apparent increasing trend. But I think it's worth taking, you know, a step back and looking at, you know, what happened prior to the years in this graph, because it kind of helps put some perspective on it, right? So uh, if we rewind again, I'm a Forest Service employee, and so I'm going to talk about the Forest Service a little bit. So um, the Forest Service was born in 1905, and it is... Uh, only the second largest land management agency in the United States, but they still manage 78 million hectares of land, which is a huge, huge amount of land, right? So their policies have obviously had an, an effect on, um, on a lot of things on, in terms of fire in the United States. So they were formed in 1905, and five years later in 1910, we had the infamous 1910 fires which 
over a million hectares of land burned in two days in uh, northern Idaho and western Montana. And what that looked like um, was this. So I'm, I'm coming to you today from Missoula, Montana, which is over here on the map. Um, the next biggest town over, if you drive on the interstate, is Coeur d'Alene. So that is 265 kilometers away. So if you're driving on the interstate here, it's interstate, interstate speeds are like 120 kilometers an hour. It takes two and a half hours to drive there. And everything you see in red here burned in two days which is um, like, I mean, we can't wrap our head around that even, even now, right? So, you know, the, the interesting thing about the Forest Service is it's actually part of the Department of Agriculture um, and not the Department of Interior, like our national parks. So that, the reason for that is because we are a timber management agency as well, right? So we are kind of in charge of um, dealing with some of the timber and growing the wood that we use to build our homes and things like that. So that was a whole lot of valuable timber that went up in two days. So you can imagine this agency like kind of panicked after this, right? They're, they're young, they're new, they, they're trying to figure out what, you know, what their roles are. And then this happens. So they started very aggressively fighting fire. Um, not that we weren't fighting fire before, but it became like number one priority, right? And so by 1935, we had instituted this uh, a formal policy called the 10 a.m. policy meaning that we were to put out every wildfire by 10 a.m. the next day. That was the goal, not to let anything burn more than 24 hours. We had to get on it. And so followed that by the uh, invent of Smokey Bear. So this was possibly one of the most successful public ad campaigns in the U.S. ever. Because if you were to ask anybody, like, what's Smokey Bear and what's their slogan, they could tell you that only you can prevent forest fires, right? So we started really hammering the public to convince them, you know, that fires are bad, you have to do everything you can to stop them. So follow all of this history by the fact that the 1950s and 60s had relatively mild summers, you can kind of understand then why the left part of this graph doesn't have a whole lot in the way of fire, right? <laughs> so we were really getting on it. We had the public convinced, we had cool summers. So everything was ripe for having, you know, as little fire as possible, whereas, you know, things are changing, right? We're not, we don't have mild summers anymore. We don't, we have, we have summers that are blending into our falls and springs and winters and um, because climate change. So the interesting thing is, is, so this is, you know, a snapshot of time, but if we were to go back a little bit further uh, in, in the history before some of these things happened, we would see that it turns out that a lot more acres used to, a lot more area used to burn in the United States. You know, back in say like 1930, more than 20 million hectares of land burned in the United States. And if we were to go back even further, uh, we can see that that number is close, is over 80 million hectares, um, which said we can't, I mean, get our heads around like how that could possibly happen today, right? And it turns out, you know, that the reason so much area burned, one of the reasons was because of the Native Americans. Um, the Native Americans, it's been well established, used fire as a tool to improve their hunting grounds, to improve their foraging, to produce things like the shoots they needed to build to make their baskets. And this is another one of those things that's not limited to just the United States. This is true definitely in Canada and Australia as well. And you know, the thing about the United States is you know, we've seen that no matter how hard we try with our smoky bear, we can't stop fire from happening, right? We've stopped all of our, tried to stop all of our people ignitions. Um, but you know, in the Western part of the US, lightning is very much a real thing. And it, that is probably only gonna get worse with climate change, right? So this, these maps and these graphs show the proportion of lightning caused ignitions, that's the blue, to human caused ignitions that are in red. And you can see a lot of the Western part of the US is primarily lightning. Um, cost ignition. So no matter how hard we try to stop fires from happening, they're going to happen and they have happened. And that's okay. Um, so if we go back to that initial scary graph of, you know, how much fire there's been, and we change the axis to the, you know, uh, y-axis of the historical, you know, amount of fire, you can see that what we burn now is barely a blip. The problem, however, the, the difference is that more of our fires look like this on more days than look like that. So historically, when we used to have 80 million hectares of land burned a year, you, you have to reburn places pretty regularly, right? And there wouldn't be a lot of fuel. And so you'd get a lot more of that low intensity fire um, than what we're seeing now. So really what we've done for our modern, you know, quote, fire regime is put out all of those good fires that used to happen 
and save up everything for like the most extreme conditions when it's the hottest, driest, windiest days, because those are the days we can't put it out right away. And those are the days when our support suppression forces are completely overwhelmed and ineffective. So we're getting more area burned under those extreme conditions than really should be. So you might be wondering, you know, how do, how do we know all this, right? Because how can you go back in time and see how much area burned before re modern record keeping, right? Well, and the answer to that is fire ecology, because that is, you know, what they do. They go out into the, into the forest and they look for evidence of these previous fires. And one of the trees that actually records a great um, record of previous fire is a, the ponderosa pine tree. So it, it grows quite all over the western part of the US. And it um, has this really great fire adaptation because it's used to fire that it has very thick, corky bark. So, you know, in, in areas where these trees grow, historically they burn, you know, quite regularly. So it kept the fuels really low. So when a fire would burn in these areas, it would, the flames would only be, you know, maybe at most a meter tall. And so it would hit these trees, hit this corky bark, sometimes not do anything at all, but sometimes it would damage a little section of the bark and leave a scar, which is what's in this picture here that this guy is sampling. And so every, once the bark is open, every time another fire comes through, it, you know, hits, hits it and can make a little record or a little scar in the tree. And so fire ecologists then go back out in the forest and they, you know, take these tree cook cuttings or these cookies, that's what they're called, um, and count the rings back and can they can put together, you know, how often that tree saw fire. And so this is taken from, um, you know, Montana, where I uh, am currently talking to you from. And you can see the fire happened really quite regularly. Like this tree germinated probably sometime in the 1500s. Um, and it's recorded its first fire in 1659, but again, that's because that was probably the time it finally, you know, cracked open that bark enough to start recording every other fire after that. And they were happening, you know, every six to 15 years after that, you know, and then they suddenly stopped in 1915 and there hasn't been a fire there since. Um, and that has had a dramatic change in the way these forests look. So this is a time series of pictures that were taken in one location uh, over 80 years. And you can see you know, how drastically the forest has changed, right? So in 1909, the, it's super open. You have only these like really big trees that are widely spaced. You can easily ride a horse through it. But over 80 years of putting out all of our fires, it's really become this overgrown mess where you can barely even walk through it, right? So you've got the tree, Trees are changing, you've got a lot more fir trees. The fuel is very continuous all the way from the ground, all the way to the tree canopies. And what you can't see from the picture is also very continuous horizontally around the, across the landscape, right? So it, it doesn't you know, take a whole lot of imagination to, to see how very different a fire would be in the forest of 1989 than it would in the forest of 1909 in these set of pictures here. So this is kind of what we're dealing with in a lot of areas, particularly in the western part of the US. But again, so this is a thing in Australia and Canada as well, um, in particular, because they've had a very, very much the same history and very much the same um, sort of policies and results. So that's what this graph, th this great um, map here actually shows is was put together by the Nature Conservancy, and they kind of bend everything into sort of three been some ecosystem that is fire dependent, like our ponderosa pines, you know, in order to survive and thrive, it, it needs fire. Uh, there's fire sensitive, you know, things like the, the rainforest in Brazil and fire independent that can kind of go either way. And you could see that the yellow, that fire dependent ecosystems cover a huge amount of the globe, right? I mean, this is, this is a global problem here. So that brings us to the like the the challenge of wildfires, right? It's a pickle, you know. Fires are inevitable. Where no matter how hard we try to pe stop people from starting them, they still start them. Lightning is still a thing. They're gonna happen. Um, and the thing is, is they don't have to be disasters. And there are a lot of ecosystems that need fire to thrive and to be healthy. But they just need the right kind of fire. Uh, the problem is, is that people and fires don't mix. <laughs> So people and their structures don't mix with fire, right? So we have to figure out how to live with it in one way or another. Um, and that really would involve, especially in the US where we've had this, this effect of the fire exclusion is restoring our forests and the role of fire back to what they used to be so that we can you know, manage it. And this is especially true in areas um, with, that are key watersheds. I say key watersheds because 
um, our forests actually provide a lot of water. Um, and then in the US, our national forests actually provide drinking water for 60 million people. And so when a fire comes through the area where you know a lot of the, the water is gathered and stored, I, that ruins the water for a lot of people. So um, you know that's pretty important. And also obviously near the wildland urban interface, we need to figure out how to, to fix things. And really living with fire is a two-part problem, right? I mean, we need our houses to not burn down and that's a two-step process, right? We need to harden our, our structures. We need, we need to reduce the structural ignitability, but we also can do the work on the other side of things to reduce the exposure, right? Because it's a lot easier to harden a structure to a, a less intense fire. So if we can do something to reduce the intensity of that fire, then we're, it's gonna be a lot easier to save homes. And to do that, we would do um, what's called hazardous fuel reductions. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second, but the idea is to reduce that fire intensity. And this has been recognized a bit in the United States, you know, quite some time ago, there's actually an act of Congress that requires at-risk communities to address both of these. Um, but, you know, as you can imagine, um, there are some huge issues um, that are standing in the way, particularly cultural, social, and political issues, right? Because it takes time to change. It, these things cost a lot of money, both in terms of, you know, what the government does and what the, the people with their homes have to do. And it also requires a willingness to change. And that, uh, that too is also a big challenge because um, it's not going to be comfortable and people are not going to want to do things. And as I said, that's both on the government policy side and that's also on the, the homeowner side. So, I mean, this is like, this is a, a really big uh, you know, stumbling block and that what rightly requires a lot of, uh, you know, it's like uh, sociology and social um, research to try to understand how we can get past some of these issues. Um, but those aside, uh, on the engineering side, um, there are, you know, research that needs that we have that, you know, we could be working on um, to have a lot of these things ready when people are willing to change. And that, you know, it, again, it's a two part problem. So we could be working on structure ignition issues, right? And I would already argue that um, the fire protection engineering community has already heard this call and because they are actively engaged in testing and building code development. Um, the other thing I think that's very important is to be able to get the engineering community to work on understanding how ways that we can reduce the exposure and better do hazardous fuel reduction. Um, again, the purpose is to alter fire behavior, um, and that means it's less intense on the soil and the vegetation, which helps our watersheds. It helps you know, the ecosystems themselves because they, a lot of them are used to lower intensity fire. But again, it also minimizes the structure exposures, right? It's gonna be a lot harder a lot easier to build a home that can survive a lower intense fire, low intensity fire. And if we can get the fire intensity to come down um, as it approaches a community, it allows for a lot more successful intervention. Our firefighters are actually going to be able to do something instead of just, you know, kind of have to stand out of the way. So with these hazardous fuel reduction um, treatments usually consist of uh, doing a, a, some combination of three things. So thinning, which is what this woman is doing here. She's just going in and cutting down trees. You know, and this reduces the number of trees, you know, in a given area, which helps the fuel load and helps prevent, you know, like continuous crown fire where it's running from the treetop to treetop. Another common technique is called masticating, which is basically chipping. So we've got these big machines that can come in, you know, and, and basically like chip an entire tree all at once. It goes from the top all the way down to the ground and just completely destroys it into, into wood chips. Um, so this basically um, re rearranges the fuel, right? So instead of having a, a continuous layer of fuel from the ground all the way to the top, you've kind of put all, knocked it all down onto the ground. So you have a lot more surface fuels, but we you have a lot less uh, fuels up in the, in the tree canopy. And the third, probably most important um, technique is prescribed burning because really that is the only way you're actually going to reduce the amount of fuel um, that's out there. So when managers go out and do these kinds of um, fuel reductions, they're, they're largely relying on their experience. Um, when we have some science tools, but they're, they're, li they're limited in terms of their applicability and um, their accuracy. So again, this is another US centric example, but a lot of these tools are actually used around the world. Um, so, I mean, we have dozens of tools for all sorts of things. For fire behavior, we've got half a dozen different tools. 
that um, can model fire in different ways. We've got ways of predicting the wind at very you know local topography levels, right? Because normally our weather models are just larger scale stuff, so they can't uh, take into effect um, take into effect the um, tight little canyons or little mountain hills and stuff like that, and the way the wind has to flow around that. We've got all sorts of tools for detecting fires. We have all sorts of tools for planning in terms of fire danger rating. This is again, uh, you know, if you were to drive from any U.S. city out into the countryside where there might be, you know, trees, you're going to see a sign with Smokey Bear pointing, you know, your fire hazard today is high, you know, so that's you know, something we do a lot of. Uh, we also have great um, tools to, to estimate our risk, right? So this map on the, the right over here shows that we do these entire nationwide maps where we look at you know the risk to homes and we can identify areas where you know you're you got to do something because <laughs> you're at risk. Um, we actually even have a system that's you know coming up online and and it has come up online in the last you know, few years that actually helps people decide how to do fuel treatments and that's the interagency fuel treatment decision support system or IFTDIS. We've got all sorts of tools for fuels. We know we've got satellite images of where our fuels are. We can even you know, do a simulator to find out how those forests are going to grow in the future. So we have all of these amazing tools. The problem is, is underlying them, if you start looking under the hood and all of them, they all have the same basic fire behavior models in them. Um, so all of them, all of our fire behavior models, even the fuel treatment support, support system does the same thing in terms of fire behavior. Uh, and this is where some of our limitations really start coming in, right? So for surface fire, um, this is the fires down on the ground where you're burning grasses and the, the pine needles and the leaves that have fallen, maybe some shorter shrubs. We use the Rothermel spread equation as a basis. It was developed in 1972, actually in the very lab that I work in. And that's actually a picture of some of those experiments that are being done. Um, but it is a semi-empirical model that was based on wind tunnel burns. and this is where some of the limitations come in is that it was meant for steady state spread and it was developed in homogeneous dead fuels and only works in the head fire direction. So the fire spreading in the direction of the wind, which you can obviously imagine fire spread across landscapes. So they go in all directions, not just with the wind. So it wasn't until a modification was proposed by Albini that we were able to use um, the, the Rothermel spread equation for more realistic fuels, like heterogeneous fuels and live fuels, right? Because if you were to go out and look at a forest, it's not all one size fuel, right? You've got a mixture of a whole bunch of different stuff. And he used basically what I would call a voodoo weighting, voodoo weighting scheme for fuel loading. So he, I mean, it made sense at the time, um, just, just basically did some weighting schemes and it, and it seems to reasonably work. But when you go to use this model, um, you have to go, uh, to use the Rothamel spread equation, you have to go shopping for a fuel model. So because of the way they've had to weight these things, it's, there's a lot of math involved. So if you've got a fire burning in grass, you go to one of the grass fuel models and you say, oh, it's about this tall, so it's fuel model two. If you've got timber and you've got a bunch of you know down logs, you go to the fuel models and you say, oh, I'm gonna use this fuel model because this looks more like what I have, right? So the important thing for understanding, you know, how fire spreads into communities is that there is no fuel model for the wildland urban interface. These are wildland fuel models on a wildland fire spread equation, and it stops at the community and it, and it, we can't necessarily model directly into the community, um, nor should we, because we were never meant to do this right with this model. So um, that's an important thing to understand when we're talking about risk to homes and stuff is that we've had to do a lot of finessing in terms of, you know, how far into the community um, a home would be considered at risk. So that's the surface spread model. We also have one for when the fire transitions from the surface of the, of the, of the forest up into the tree canopies. And that transition is predicted using a model from Van Wagner that was based on, who's actually Canadian, uh, eight experimental and wildland fires. Um, and it predicts that torching or the burnout of a single tree will occur when the surface intensity attains a critical value. And that's based on the crown base height and the fol foliage ignition energy, or which is related to its moisture content. So it's a very simple model um, based on a, a few fires, essentially. 
Um, and once it's in this tree canopy, we have a, a model to predict what's called active crown fire spread. And that's another one from Rothamol, but later 1991. And this is a purely empirical correlation that's based on eight data points from seven fires. And it only considers, this is a very important point, wind-driven crown fires, ones that look like this image here, where the plume can be tilted over by the wind. Um, because the, the plume dominated fires, ones where you get these big tall columns of smoke above them, didn't fit the correlation, so they were excluded. So this correlation basically just multiplies the surface rate of spread by some factor, and that's your result. So, I mean, obviously it's a very limited data set, so you can, with limitations already imposed on it, um, so you can see how there might be um, some limitations here. Um, so on a, I will acknowledge that the Canadian and the Australian systems do things differently, right? So they actually have a pretty extensive um, empirically based uh, models, but pretty extensive. Um, their, their models are based on extensive um, field measurements, right? So they have a lot of uh, field data and they've used that to make their correlations. Um, but, you know, the, there's still some limitations there as well. Um, and some of the underlying issues with our models are the same underlying issues with them, is that if, especially if you're relying on an empirical model, um, you can't apply it outside the conditions that you used to train that model, right? Um, and we're getting a lot more of those extreme days where no, no one's fire model works well. So our operational models, um, just in a nutshell here, just to recap, are purely empirical or semi-empirical based on handfuls of data, particularly in the US, which makes them very useful, but they're not right. right? There's miss they're missing a lot of important behaviors and they're missing pretty much all of the physics. So when you go to use them, a lot of art is required to compensate for a lot of the stuff that's missing and to compensate for unknown inputs, right? Because even despite all of these awesome satellite images and data of what our fuels are, they're often like five or six years old by the time we get them to use them and things can change. Weather forecasts are you know, notoriously hard to do, right? So we don't know the weather in more than three days out. And it's hard to compensate for that. And we do have research models, right? There are CFD models out there that can be used for wildland fire. Um, but you know, there's still a lot of assumptions about what has to go on in the subgrid processes because you know the things that are happening while a fire, the ignition and everything is happening on the millimeter scale, but then it has to spread over kilometers of, of landscape, right? So there's six order six orders of magnitude there. So obviously something has to give and some assumptions have to be made. And because of this, there's a lot of different models out there and they all do things differently, like a little bit differently, right? Because they're making different assumptions. And ultimately they take too long to run. Um, which is, is challenging for our operational environment, right? Because if we want to make better, say, risk maps over the entire you know, US, we need something that runs in an instant, not something that has to chug away around a CFD model because we're running you know, Monte Carlo in, you know, type simulation where we're running thousands and thousands of, of instances. So you need something that runs very quickly. Um, and ultimately we can't, it's very hard to use them operationally because our fire managers aren't trained to use them. I mean, I have a PhD in mechanical engineering and I'm scared to use uh, a lot of CFD models because I know just how you know, sensitive it can be to boundary conditions and, uh, and initial conditions. So um, those are things that we have to, to kind of work around. Um, so you know, our models are, are limited in terms of where we can use them. They work great in mild and moderate conditions where you know, a lot of them were developed and the data that went into them came from. Um, but there's a lot of things they can't do, right? So I mentioned that the Rothamo spread equation has limitations, right? It was never meant to work in discontinuous fuels. It's not used, it can't be used for non-steady spread. It was meant for the head fire direction with the wind. So we don't have models we, really to, to work. We, in the opposite directions, right? So backing fire into the wind or flanking fire where it's going perpendicular to the wind. Nor can we answer questions about thresholds to, an to, to answer, will a fire even spread? And so all of those things are actually really important to understand fuel treatment effectiveness, right? <laughs> so where we have to kind of look at these things, it's not just, you know, the head fire in a, a uniform fuel bed. So this really points to the fact that we have a general lack of understanding of the underlying physics. Um, you know, the, my other bullet point here is that our models aren't good for large scale fire behavior either. Um, because again, we just don't have the physics incorporated into it. So it turns out we have a lot of unanswered questions because we don't understand the physics, right? We can't, 
answer clearly, you know, why fires spread faster when the wind blows? Why do they spread faster uphill? When do they transition and why from a surface fire to a crown fire? Life fuels are this crazy, under, like totally not understood thing because they can you know, burn with moisture contents well over 100%, where they're mostly water, but a dead fuel won't burn over of mo the moisture content of more than a 10 or 15%. Um, we've got some tree species that burn great uh, in crown fires and some that don't, and we don't, can't really explain why. And we have other like, uh, observational things you know why why you're when you're out burning a prescribed fire and the sun is out it goes great and then a cloud comes covers the sun and then suddenly it kind of peters out and goes down and then the cloud moves the sun comes out and it perks back up like why we can't really explain that it, as well as things like extreme fire behaviors right i've got a picture here of from last fall in oregon and this might be a trick of the camera i don't know but we can't touch that with our models or our understanding I don't know what's going on there. That looks crazy. So in order to be able to do better, to live with fire, to be able to do our, our fuel treatments better and have some you know, firm understanding of science, we, we need to understand fire behavior better and the fundamental physics of it. Um, we can do better training for our firefighters with it, you know, because often right now, you know, when you hear on the news, you know, like they a, a very common quote is. You know, we've never seen fire behavior like this. It was completely unexpected. Well, maybe if we understood the, understood how it worked, we wouldn't be surprised by it anymore. We would, we would kind of be able to predict it. Um, if we understand it better, like I said, we'd be, we'll be able to do better planning and mitigation and we'll have better predicted cap capabilities when we have to actually be in suppression mode. And so that is the goal of our research team is to be able to describe exactly how fire spreads because we need a more physically based, computationally efficient model that we can use in an operation environment that alleviates a lot of the limitations and inaccuracies of what we currently have. Um, so that's what our group is working on. And we, um, so I wanna talk, switch gears a little bit and actually talk about the research. <laughs> so um, the, the way we have approached the problem is, um, is to treat fire spread as a series of ignitions, right? We all know that that's a very common way of looking at it from fire protection engineering, um, but it wasn't actually uh, a very commonly done in wildland fire, right? Because they are very you know, focused on understanding to having a rate of spread, but they didn't look at the, the parts of it. So that's what we're doing. We're breaking down fire spread into its component parts where we look at it as a series ignition, right? So we have a fuel that ignites, it burns and releases energy, and some of that energy is transferred as heat to the unburnt fuel, and if fire spread is going to continue enough, heat has to be transferred for the next um, chunk to ignite. So I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've been doing in each of these sort of three areas, starting with heat transfer. Um, so you know, a lot of what we know about fire comes from the fire protection engineering field, right? But the context is very different, right? So when we're talking about fires and structures, it's large fuels. It's, it's walls, it's furniture, it's big pools of liquid. And that's very different from what actually burns in a wildland fire. So what carries the flaming front in a wildland fire is fine fuels, the things that are like a millimeter in diameter. So they're very, very fine. They're discrete particles that are widely separated by gaps of air. And it's living vegetation, right? Which chemically, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit, can, can change drastically over the growing season or even during the day. So the fuel is very different, which changes um, the way it heats up and ignites actually. So if you were to take a block of wood and stick it in front of a radiant heat panel, say in this case here at 37 kilowatts per meter squared of irradiance, that block of wood heats up and ignites in about 35 seconds. And we've got great correlations that predicts that predicts it and it works and it's it's good. But if you were to put uh, you know, a loose wad of this shredded wood, uh, which is called Excelsior, um, which only has diameter of about a millimeter in front of that same radiant heat source, it can sit there indefinitely because even after five minutes, there's only part of it that barely started to char. So in fact, you can put clumps of grass in front of a radiant heater and it doesn't do anything. <laughs> so uh, if you, you know, put a thermocouple on here, you can kind of start to see why, right? So the, the bigger block of wood, uh, the surface temperature very clearly, you know, increases, heats up, it hits the that ignition temperature and ignites. Whereas something that's a fine fuel um, does heat up, um, but then it kind of sits there and it levels its temperature levels off somewhere, you know, right around like say 200 degrees, which is barely enough to char. 
So it turns out that, you know, fine fuels are really effectively cooled by convection. Any little air current or even just natural convection is enough to offset, in this case, over 40 kilowatts per meter squared of radiant heat. So it can't be radiation that's igniting these fine particles suspended in the air, right? So, which is contrary to, you know, everything we've learned about fire from structure fires, right? Can't be conduction because they're separated by gaps of air. So really the thing that's actually getting our fine fuels, the wildland fuels to, to ignite and go is flame contact. Um, because really like that's the only explanation that's left. But this kind of caused a problem and was, has been largely ignored because it was kind of not really appreciated how, you know, flames are buoyant, they're hot, they wanna go up. So how can they possibly go down and forward into the fuel bed to, to ignite things? So this was a, something that was really just hard to, to kind of get our heads around. You know, often we would draw fire fronts, you know, our schematics like this one in the center here, right? Where it's like, here's this vertical wall of flame, how can convection possibly be happening? So to understand that, we went back to the drawing board and did an enormous amount of fire spread experiments. Um, but this is where we differed a little bit. Instead of using pine needles or that shredded wood Excelsior stuff, we wanted to use a fuel bed that was very, very controllable. Um, and so we kind of settled on this idea of using these cardboard combs because they're very repeatable. Um, we can control them in any way we want them. So this is what they look like. They've got this sort of spine that we can then stick um, in, in sort of slats of this kind of concrete stuff to kind of keep them vertical. Um, and then we cut them out with a laser cutter so we can make any kind of size and shape that we want with them. So we've done um, 62 fires in our wind tunnel where we varied um, the, all of those parameters, right? So we had some really tall stuff, some shorter stuff, some tightly packed stuff. Um, varied the wind, um, looked at all of those different uh, conditions and variables. And then we did a bunch of them on a slope um, in our burn chamber as well. So this is kind of what we saw. So let me see if I can play this video here. So once we finally got rid of all fuel variability, there's a lot of structures in the flames that really began to stand out, right? So here in this video, uh, you can clearly see that there are very distinct towers and troughs, right? Which um, are not a result of any kind of fuel variability, right? Because there isn't any. So this is really, um, uh, these peaks and troughs are a result of something else, fluid dynamics. And so uh, it turns out that, you know, the, the things like the fuel load and the wind speed kind of change the number of peaks and troughs that are there, but they're always there, you know, which kind of makes sense because if you were to, to hand a kindergartner a crown, a crayon and tell them to draw fire, they would probably draw peaks and troughs, right? <laughs> but it was never really appreciated that this was important for fire spread. And so once we saw them in the wind tunnel, we started seeing them everywhere. So these are grass fire burns um, out and around really the world. Um, we saw them in this really big crib fire that we did back in our backyard one winter. It's the same for peaks and troughs, right? And you can even see them in crown fires. So this is um, from a paper where they started looking at um, using an IR image of some of the flows that were going in and around this crown fire. You can see um, there are distinct peaks and um, this paper actually pointed out that you know, fire was bursting out forward too. Um, so like I said, it's, it's actually a fluid dynamic instability and not anything related to inhomogeneities of the fuel or really, unfortunately, sad for me, it's not related to combustion. It's purely due to the fact that there are, when you have a boundary layer flow over a heated surface, you get these streamwise vortex pairs that form. So as the, the air flows over the heated surface, um, things start to rotate. And so where the um, vortex pairs come together, they, in the upward direction, it makes the peaks. And when they come together in the downward direction, it makes that trough. So this is how fires, uh, you know, really hot buoyant flames can stay down in the fuel bed. So there's an additional um, instability that goes on that's very similar to like the puffing of a pool fire or the flicker of, the can of a candle flame that actually then pushes the airflow forward. You get a little puff that can originate down in the back and that moves forward. And you can see that with some of the, some basic flow tracing. So if you watch the trough here, you can see that there are periodically some, some puffs that come forward and really push that flame forward. So this is kind of where fire spread is actually happening. It's down in those troughs with these bursts of flames. Um, so, you know, 
understanding that there are these bursts of flames is great, but if it doesn't have an effect on the fuel, then you know we're still back to the drawing board. So this is what um, these graphs actually show some of the work that we did um, to try to just confirm that the fuels are responding to those, those puffs. So the red line here is a radiometer that's sitting right next to a one millimeter particle that has a thermocouple embedded on the surface. So that surface fuel particle, uh, that temperature is the black line. And then there is a thermocouple sitting right next to it that measures the air temperature. So you can see as the fire progresses and moves toward the fuel, this red line, the, the radiant heat starts to slowly increase, but you know, it's still at relatively modest levels, right? So even, you know, maybe 20 seconds out, we're at maybe 15 kilowatts per meter squared of radiant heat. And the particle, the black line is indeed um, heating up, but you know, it's still barely, you know, evaporating water, um, a few, you know, about 30 seconds before it ignites. Um, and, but things don't really start happening until about the last 20 seconds. And that's what's zoomed in here on that, um, on the right graph, is you can really start to see how there's these pulses of hot gases that move by that fuel particle. And yet you can really see it starting to stair step up its temperature. And that's really ultimately how it, it gets there in time um, to, to ignite. So um, it turns out that convection can really cool uh, fine fuel particles and the radiant heat fluxes that you see in surface fires, especially, um, but even in crown fires, are too low to ignite in the time that there is, right? I mean, this is, you, the ignition has to happen in about 30 seconds or it doesn't, right? And so if you've got radiant heat fluxes of 15 kilowatts per meter squared, a big block of wood even isn't going to ignite in that, in that quickly. So the fine fuels in a wildland fire really stair step their way up. Um, in terms of temperature to ignite by intermittent flame contact. So that brought us to our ignition studies where we actually have done a bit, quite a bit of work looking at ignition and how it differs with convective heating. And I think maybe you may have saw, seen some of that work um, in your class earlier today. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about um, live fuels and how they ignite because they're really very different. So um, this is a video you can, may have seen this, of, of a leaf that grows in the southeast part of the United States being heated by 800 degrees Celsius air. And we're looking at it in a thousand frames per second. Um, you can see as it starts to heat up that, you know, some of the, the waxes and stuff get shiny, the little bubbles start to form, but then that happens, right? Chunks of like the leaf actually blow off. You know, this is, this is very different than what wood or, you know, foam or some kind of polymer would do, right? Um, that's not that's not normal. Um, th another example, this is grand fir. This grows um, in the area where I live. So this is a side by side, same thousand frames per second, um, but we're comparing the visual and the infrared camera here. And um, as it starts to heat up, you can also see that, you know, the way it heats up and the way it releases water is very different um, than would be from a, a uh, just wood or wet wood. Um, it can be quite explosive um, and dramatic. <laughs> I'm just going to let this play here for a second. So what's really impressive is that some of these vapors that are being shot out um, from the fuel are actually flammable. So it's not just water that's coming out of the fuels. It's interesting that it kind of goes quiet for a little while before it actually ignites. But yeah, there was another good jet of something flammable shooting out there. It's impressive too how much action is going on with the IR camera that you don't see in the visual. <laughs> 
but I think we've seen the point there. So, you know, a lot of our models treat live fuels as simply like thermally thin wet wood. And um, I th think that needs to be done with a whole hell of a lot of caution, right? So we've, we've got data here that shows um, the ignition time versus moisture content. And if it were simply, if live fuels were simply wet wood, um, they would behave like um, this particular fuel here did, right? So the ignition time would increase as the moisture content would increase. But there are fuels like the one we saw the first video of like Fetterbush and this other gallberry, this other shrub over here that also grows in Florida that actually ignite faster the wetter they are. So this is uh, not, you know, we can't really understand this and wrap our head around this. Um, and so we can't just kind of plod, you know, keep plowing forward by treating live fuels as wet wood. Um, and they're certainly not thermally thin either. So, you know, the question is why? What is so different with live fuels? Well, there's, I think that there's a couple of different reasons, right? So one is that they're very structurally different. They're living cells, they're, um, that, which changes the way it can hold water, right? So if it's wood, it's dead. All the, the cells have kind of collapsed so that it cuts off ways of storing water. Whereas if it's a living fuel, the, the, the cells themselves are, are inflated, they can hold on to water. Um, and so it's a different mode of, of water storage. So, I mean, as indicated by the fact that, you know, wood has a water saturation point of about 30, 35% moisture content where live fuels are over hundred percent. That's because they can store water in a different way. Uh, also, there's a structural difference between fuels that often burn in wildland fires and fuels that don't because they, uh, fuels that burn in wildland fire typically um, have very dry summers, right? So they have a mechanism built into the structure of the leaf or the needle that helps them retain water. So the outside is very waxy often and um, it really tries to seal itself off so that it can hold on to what precious water it has. So that, you know, also helps kind of retain the water to, to make it pop like popcorn, essentially, when you um, heat it up and burn it. So there's also some chemical difference with live fuels as well, right? So they're living, breathing, photosynthesizing leaves and needles. So the, the fact that there's, they're made from hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin like wood is only like part of the story. In fact, only about half of the dry mass is, those, is that cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. But there's a whole lot of other things in there, like the sugars and starches from photosynthesis that it's producing, moving around the plant. There's fats, there's proteins, and really the amount of lignin that it has within each, each leaf and needle is dependent on whether it's deciduous or not. And so that can vary from one tree species to the next. And there's also this underlying question of exactly what moisture content means for a live fuel anyway, right? So moisture content is usually calculated as the mass of water divided by the dry mass of the fuel. So if you've got a living, breathing, photosynthesizing plant, the dry mass is changing constantly by photosynthesis and its processes. So you can have an apparent change in moisture content without ever actually changing the amount of water that's in that needle or leaf. So we really need to, this all kind of points to, to, you know, we don't understand live fuels and we have to go back to the drawing board in order to figure out how we can describe them in ways that are meaningful to predict how they, they ignite and burn. So that's kind of kind of the, the chat, one of the huge challenges of understanding wildland fire. And so for the last just couple minutes, I want to talk very briefly about some of the work we're doing with combustion and energy release or the heat release rate, because it's it's important. It's part of this process. Um, it helps us understand the, the spread rate. It gives us you know, dimensions for our flame zones so that we can understand the peaks and troughs. Um, it's also important in terms of a residence time or to, to understand whether a fire will even spread, right? Because if you've got a discontinuous fuel, um, if this clump of grass burns out before this clump of grass ignites, fire is not going to spread. So it's kind of an important part of, of understanding that. Um, it's also important for fire effects uh, in terms of you know, whether or not a tree will live through a fire or not. Um, and the current way we deal with it in our operational models is a very, very simple model. And it's not actually in the spread behavior model, it's in some of the other uh, outputs. And that's just simply by saying that the residence time is eight times the diameter and it doesn't take into account any other parameters like wind or moisture content that should be affecting it. So we've done a lot of work with wood cribs. Um, they're used regularly in fire protection engineering, but much like those cardboard combs to understand fire spread, uh, it, we went back to very basic fuel beds so that we could just very carefully vary all of the little different parameters of it. 
uh, and understand the underlying physics of what's going on with how it burns. So I've spent an enormous amount of time and I can spend an entire hour talking just about wood crib research, but I'm not um, looking at um, you know, different questions, right? So they're used a lot in fire protection engineering. We've got correlations that predict how they burn, but you know, they were done, if you go back to the original paper by Gross, um, with a very limited set of cribs, once again. Um, he used cribs that were perfect cubes with sticks that were 10 times longer than their thickness. So the obvious question would be, well, do those relationships hold for different sizes and shapes of, of fuel beds? Um, the, the other thing that's kind of was glossed over in some of those early works is how far up off the ground they need to be to not re restrict the airflow into the fuel bed. And that was important for wildland fire, right? Because you've got surface fuels and you've got ground fuels. And so how does the, the flow uh, uh, underneath actually affect the burning rate? Um, what happens when you put them in the wind tunnel? Because, you know, wind and wildland fires is very much a thing. Um, our, we wanted to know too, if large fires burn differently than small fires, the effect of moisture content, you know, we're looking at things like you know, we're, we're focused on cribs, which are an axisymmetric fire, but wildland fires were typically have a concept of it being a line fire, right? So it's fine fuels, things ignite and burn out relatively quickly. So can you take what you've learned from this axisymmetric fire and apply it to an element of a line fire? And finally, what happened, the question that we're working on right now is what happens when you actually control the amount of airflow through the crib? Because um, there were some lessons learned from the wind tunnel tests that um, we needed to resolve. So I'm running out of time, so maybe I won't talk very briefly about this, or I will only talk very briefly about um, some of the work that we did to look at the difference between large fires and small fires, right? Because historically, our understanding of fire has, has been fires that look like this. I said they're line fires, but as fires get bigger and more intense, they're turning into more of these area fires characterized by these big plumes of smoke. Um, and this was actually brought on by a video from some uh, from a prescribed fire um, that one of our coworkers had done, where just the nutshell of the video is that a surface fire comes through, uh, burns all of the grasses, but then the crown fire comes through and it reignites absolutely everything. So it looks like the ground is on fire um, and all of the big logs and everything that you wouldn't think would burn and that shouldn't burn in a wildland fire do because of this environment that's being created in this large area but that video is a little bit long. So in, in essence, one of our theory was that when the fire gets big, the plume gets really wide, it gets very tall and it restricts airflow into it. So the question was whether or not restricting the airflow into the plume had a result on the underlying burning behavior of, of the fuels underneath it. So we did a bunch of experiments where we simply mimicked this restriction of airflow into the plume by using a chimney. Um, we did a bunch of different tests, different chimney heights, um, and it turns out it has a huge effect. So I'm going to very briefly just let this play. So this is a side by side of two cribs, one outside of the chimney, one inside the chimney. And as soon as I push it under the chimney, this is uh, couldn't couldn't light it in the chimney, had to light it outside of the chimney. But you can see um, in just a just a moment here um, that this burning in a chimney with the induced plume entrainment actually had a pretty dramatic effect on the way it burned. So looking at some data here on my next slide, um, in fact, there were cases where it, it tripled the burning rate. Many other uh, fuel bed designs had still increased, but you know, much more moderately so. So um, that's what these figures here are showing is this increase. So the taller the chimney, the bigger the increase. Um, same here as well, but there were some that didn't. So with, with smaller chimney heights, we saw that increase, but as the chimney get, got taller, turns out they didn't burn it nearly as well. And the reason why uh, we saw the increase was um, that with this chimney, right, you're, you're blocking all of the cold airflow from there. So the taller the chimney, the taller the uh, column of hot gases, the bigger the pressure difference between the column of hot gases and the ambient air, you're actually going to induce an airflow down on the ground. So it's basically basically making its own wind that blows through the fight through the fuel bed before it can um, be entrained into the plume. And so it's leaning out the fuel air mixture for our, our very densely packed fuel bed, but it also is increasing the char oxidation rate and very likely promoting flaming over smoldering. So that's a really important thing in wildland fires is that you know, you're possibly including more fuels in, in the flaming front than you, wouldn't, you would ordinarily with these big fires. 
So some of the decrease was also very puzzling, but uh, I will happily talk more about this in questions um, if we have them, but it turns out they don't burn very, some of these cribs don't burn very uniformly um, with a, a really high airflow through them. So just in summary, um, fires are inevitable, especially in areas of the, the US and the West, um, the Australia and Canada as well, at, and Europe. And a lot of our forests and ecosystems have evolved with them. So they're, they're necessary and they don't need to be disasters, but we need to figure out how to live with them. And that includes doing research in terms of structure ignition and the work to understand fire so that we can do better hazardous fuel treatments. And that's what the work at uh, the fire lab is aimed at, is understanding it better so we can make better, uh, better and more accurate predictions and think and more relevant to more relevant fire behavior. And this is very challenging and ongoing work. So with that, I will answer some questions. I see there's a couple in the chat box already. Well, at least one. Uh, hello. Hello. Sarah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I will host the Q&A section. However, okay. due to the time limit, uh, I will only ask several quick questions. So yes. the first one is that, uh, who is responsible for the mechanical treatment in the United States by firefighters or the US Forest Service? So that's a good question. So um, it depends on the area you're talking about because so the Forest Service manages a lot of land in the US. And so they will do their own fuel treatments. Um, and that is often done by people who have firefighter qualifications. Um, however, there's a lot of land that isn't on Forest Service land and say would be on private land. So somebody actually owns the you know, section of forest and they would have to do it themselves, which is part of the challenge. <laughs> yeah. And because uh, uh, the, the measure to prevent the fire is usually, as you say, to cut the trees, is there any standard to to cut, to how many trees need to be cut so as to reach a high level, high safety level? That is the million dollar question right there or billion dollar question. Um, and that's something we don't have the answer to, right? Um, and that's what I'm hoping we can get to with more research to understand fire behavior better, right? Because we don't know if we cut 10 trees or a hundred trees, what effect that's gonna have on the fire behavior. Right, our fire models weren't designed to handle that kind of fine grain questions. So that's you say that's where the research is needed. That's why we need to understand fire better so we can answer that question. Yeah. So I will ask the, the final questions. Um, will the U.S. Forest Service introduce some other bears to replay to replace the small bear to promote the prescribed burning? So that's a good question. So we have, um, you know, we were trying to kind of turn Smoky Bear into something that's not so hard against fires. We also have another little creature called Woodsy Owl that also is kind of, uh, you know, one of their ad campaign guys, but he's not as popular as Smoky Bear. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's hard. That's part of the like, it's challenged with the agency, right? Is because the agency has to acknowledge this and move forward and it's, it's hard. But yeah, I would like to see Smokey Bear with a drip torch lighting some fires. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just my, my opinion. <laughs> okay, due to the limitation of time. So I think it is time to close. Right, the I have a question. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Go so for it. More, more like a discussion. So uh, I see the data about uh, the uh, ignition time decrease with increasing moisture content. So that's very strange part. But I, I think maybe because uh, uh, the explosion, so you have a big trunk explode. So it's a locally, the, the fuel uh, mass flux will be very high in that specific location. But maybe that's a reason you, you achieve easy ignition compared to a uniform heating. Yeah, and I completely agree because, um, you know, as we saw with one of those videos, like some of those explosions were actually exploding like flammable vapors, right? Because you saw like jets of flame come out of it. So it's very possible that it's kind of adding additional 
heating to you know like the nearby part of the another leaf or something right because you're blasting it with more flaming hot gases so you're you know you're you're helping kind of stair step it to ignition by these blasts of burning gases too so yeah like it's i don't i don't know how to like i think we can simulate it so maybe yeah. like, uh, i mean i don't you say i leave that up to you because that's i'm the experimentalist here <laughs> I'm happy to run the tests and make some observations, but if you can figure out a way to simulate that, that would be amazing. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. I think that's uh, all for today's uh, presentation. We have like 65 people joined, so it's pretty good. Nice. Well, I am happy to answer any other questions offline too, if you want to shoot me emails or write them all down, I'll answer them all at once too, so. Yes, I see some interesting questions, but I, I, I'll summarize them and email you. Okay, great. I'm happy to do it. Okay. So thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. This was fun. Bye. <laughs>